Hi, everybody. I'm, I, uh, I'm Jason Gajenton. I am uh, a, a permi as well. I did my PDC with Terry Meir back in 2014, I think it was. And I have a couple acres in Leesburg and have been uh, steadily failing ever since I got started to get anything to grow with my uh, utter neglect plan. Uh, so I'm kind of reconfiguring some things and adding irrigation now to, to, to make it easy on myself uh, going forward. Um, I was an engineer up until the spring and I quit that 15 year career and uh, have joined forces with a friend of mine who has been a hobbyist with me for seven years, uh, or rather I with him. And uh, he has been a professional beekeeper working at D&J, Apiary and Umatilla for the last three years. So he jumped from that, I jumped from, from engineering and we've got our own thing going and trying to get this apiary off the ground. Uh, right now we've got about 100 colonies, uh, which, is, which is quite a lot to manage. Uh, those are separated over two yards right now. Um, this talk is not a how to beekeep talk. Um, we would be here for, for you know, 14 and a half days straight or something like that if I was going to explain how to keep bees today. Um, we don't really have time for that. What I do intend to do is to give you guys some things to think about, show you some stuff. Uh, we've got live bees up here in this box if you haven't checked it out yet. Uh, so you can come and check out our girls uh, afterwards and try to find the queen. She is up in the top box. Um, so... Yeah, I just want to give you guys kind of, the, kind of an overview, uh, some of the things that you need to learn. I want to basically give you the outline. This is what you need to know. And these are the things that people commonly screw up when they get started so that you have a better chance of being successful if you decide that you want to go down this road and have bees on your property. Um, there's, there's some, before we even get started onto the actual, actual beekeeping content, um, know that it's a really, really deep rabbit hole. Um, if you want to get into it, just be prepared to spend a lot of time um, on learning, I mean, all kinds of stuff. How to maintain your equipment, learning about bacterias and funguses that affect them, uh, learning how to, we'll get, we'll get into all of that. Um, another thing is, if you happen to have bees, or you know beekeepers, and you know a thing or two, um, please keep this in the back of your mind. If you ask 10 beekeepers for an opinion, you're going to get 13 strong opinions back. <laughs> um, and they're all going to be convinced that, that their, their opinion is correct until they change their mind an hour or so later. Um, and that's just kind of the norm with beekeepers. Um, there are multiple ways to do everything. Um, none of them are necessarily wrong. Um, and, and, a, and a handful are, are necessarily right. Um, sometimes is the most important word in beekeeping. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in gardening, you might say it differently, you know, does, does this grow here? Well, it depends. Um, <laughs> it's, so we use the word sometimes instead of saying it depends. Um, you know, does, does the queen lay all the eggs? Sometimes. Sometimes a little worker bee decides that she's going to play queen and starts laying eggs herself, but she'll screw up and put two or three eggs in one cell. Um, so there's all kinds of exceptions to every rule. Uh, which is some of the things that makes it so hard to get started and why you should not just decide that you're going to have bees and jump into it and go buy them. This is something that you need to study. You need to find a mentor. Uh, you need to take classes. Um, you will waste lots of money and time and, and just be very frustrated if you just jump in head first. Um, let's see. Honeybees are not endangered in the U.S. Uh, becoming a beekeeper, you are not saving the bees. Um, that's not how this works. The bees that are endangered are native bees. There are more European honeybees right now than there, are, there have ever been. Um, the other thing is, is, this is these are not chickens. You don't just dump food and water into a bowl and walk away and everything is going to turn out all right. They take, they take a considerable amount of, of care and attention. Um, so it, to summarize all of that, it's, it's hard, probably just don't. Um, but it's, it's also very, very rewarding, uh, and I highly recommend that you do give it a shot. Um, and if you don't jump into it and get your own bees, I definitely suggest coming out and spending a day in the bee yard with us, uh, taking an introduction class, and just hanging out and learning a little bit more. 
Um, honeybees have been around for a long, long time, a lot longer than humans. Uh, there's fossil evidence that they've been around for over 150 million years. Um, it, they've actually been used, we think, for chemical warfare uh, because there's, you can make poisonous honeybees. We'll collect honey that's, uh, that's, that's bad for you. Um, and that was, there's evidence of that, uh, 65 BC, and the ancient Egyptians and Greeks uh, kept bees as well. Um, we all know that they're, they're vital to us uh, in pollinating plants and in making sure that we're able to, to get food. And plants are able to make more plants and we're able to collect seeds uh, and continue our survival. So we, I think we all, we all understand that so far. Um, any, anybody have any questions or comments on that before we like, shock anybody by coming out and saying you shouldn't have bees to just get started? <laughs> you mentioned that bees aren't endangered. From time to time we hear about <clears throat> electronic things affecting bees. Is that legitimate? Um, I have not seen one. I haven't read or, or seen the results of any legitimate studies from any universities proving that it's detrimental uh, on a wide scale. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too, too concerned about it. Um, our, if they are messing with, there's so many other things that mess with the bees that it would be awfully hard to isolate that. Um, and there's so much RF all around us all the time um, that if it was really, really detrimental, it's very likely that it would be very detrimental to all of them and we wouldn't have any. What about when they come through your neighborhood with spraying? Um... That's bad for them. Yeah. yeah. So you can petition your uh, your city or your county and, and, and ask them to not do that. I've done that on my street. Several other neighbors have joined in, and they still come through and spray. I hope you have better luck than I do. Anything else before we, uh, before we roll along? OK. So uh, the European honeybee is Apis mellifera. Um, it just means a bee that collects honey. That's, that's all that means. Apis is bee, uh, mellifera is, you know, gathers, gathers or carries honey. Um, I, I personally think that uh, aside from their behaviors and just, just their biology itself, some of the most amazing thing about them is, is their eyes. Anybody know how many eyeballs bees have, honeybees? They have five, they got five eyes. Um, they've got one right in the middle of their forehead and they've got the two big ones that you see and then they've got two more on the side of their head. Um, and the, uh, the two on the side, they're actually, well, they got two up, up top. And the two on the sides are, are hairy. Um, and there's, there's different theories on exactly why that is and how that may or may not help them. They're hairy? Hairy eyeballs, two of, two of the five are hairy, yeah. Um, so I think that that's one of, the, one of the cool facts about things that we need to know. We don't need to get into all the biology because again, this isn't a, uh, a full instruction on how to do things. It's just the stuff that I think is really cool. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really cool is that they, how they communicate and how they interact with each other. Uh, and that's done through dances. Um, and I can demonstrate if you guys want. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so they'll give directions about like this. Go a quarter mile that way, and then turn right, and then go a half a mile, and then turn left, and you'll see the big bush. And that's literally actually how they give directions to each other, we think. Um, so they, they do what's called the waggle dance, and they shake their bodies, and they vibrate in certain ways. Um, and that's, what, that's how they give directions. That's how they come back and communicate, there's food over there. Go that way. Um, there are bees that their specific job is to go out and forage, and then come back and dance. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Uh, the other way that they communicate is pheromones. Um, so it's, it's, it's all about pheromones for, for a lot of animals on the planet. And bees are no exception. Uh, and they are particularly good at it. Um, so it's very, very neat um, to learn about that and go down that rabbit hole and learn more about what you shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't smell like when you go into a hive. There's all kinds of things you can screw up with this. Um, and smelling wrong uh, is one of the things that you can do wrong right off the bat. Um, social structure. Um, how many different kinds of bees are there in a bee colony? Does anybody know? Three. Three. So we got queen, queen bee. We have the, worker. the workers, and then we have drones. And uh, drones, 
The lesser known bee uh, exists solely to mate with the queen, and then uh, they die. Uh, they don't have stingers. Their stinger is a little, little different. Um, and it, it breaks off just like a regular stinger does, and um, the queen, uh, queen takes that semen along with the semen from uh, 20 to 50 um, other drones in a single flight, and she goes back home into her hive, and she doesn't fly again unless they swarm and take off to go make a new home. Um, so she doesn't fly around on a regular basis. Um, she just stays in the hive and lays eggs. Um, so this, this, um, um, the social and structure, the social structure, and their their mannerisms and all that are very, very important for you to understand. When you, if you're going to be a beekeeper, you've you've got to to be able to know. Like there's a there's a problem. So understanding all these all these cool little things that bees do and what what they shouldn't do um, will inform you on the health of the colony. And if you start seeing weird stuff, there's a good chance that that something has gone wrong. In that uh, in that colony, and that you need to take action uh, to prevent you know for you you from losing your bees or you know from them to, to going into uh, you know getting sick or being in uh, harm otherwise. Uh, the life cycle of the bee, so with like like every other insect out there, you know they've got they're gonna, they're gonna e you know egg and then larva and then they pup and they got a pupa stage, so they cap their their honeycomb cell over, and then they during that time, they go through a metamorphosis just like a butterfly does, and then they emerge as a, an adult, full-grown, or nearly full-grown um, insect. Um, so, and the, the life cycle of each different type of bee is different. I'm gonna move that out of the way so I can, y'all can see my face. I feel like I'm hiding over here. Um, <clears throat> so it's about 21 days um, for a worker bee. The queen is faster. It takes her less time to go from egg to full-grown adult. Um, and that's absolutely necessary for the survival of the colony because the queen needs to be born, raised quickly, sometimes in an emergency. If something happens to the queen, she needs to be born very, very quick so that they can replace that queen if she happened to die or leave. Um, so she needs to be born fast enough to go out and mate, come back and start having babies before all the other babies and bees are dead and gone because they've got pretty short lives. So the timeline of all this is, is very important. Um, and then the, uh, the drone bee takes a little bit longer. Um, they're also pretty large, but not as large as, uh, as the queen bee. And we should, should have some drones in here too somewhere, uh, possibly. This is one of our nuke colonies that I grabbed out of our, one of our bee yards on the way here. Um, so afterwards, we'll, we'll see if we can find the queen and then point out some drones so you can see their big bug eyes. They're, they're pretty cute. Um, to add to the complexity of their, their social behaviors and their life cycles that you have to know and understand how to manipulate and work with um, and judge to see if there's problems, the colony itself, the whole group of bees, also has a life cycle that it goes through. Um, and it starts much the same way that the life cycle of E does with, with eggs or with bees, um, or a, a queen bee that can lay those eggs. Um, and then the colony itself will, will wax and wane, will, will grow and shrink depending on available resources, uh, depending on the time of year, um, depending on weather, depending on disease that they may get into. Sometimes things happen and, and the population struggles. So. The, the popular, they may have built all this honeycomb and it might be a, this huge massive beehive one week and you can go back and check on that hive in a tree or in a box three days later, four days later, two weeks later and it'll shrink down to almost nothing. And if you haven't been watching, you'll have absolutely no idea what happened and why. Um, so it's, it, it can be kind of confusing sometimes. Like where where'd all my bees go? Uh, and then obviously sometimes they just continue to make more and more and more bees and more and more and more uh, honeycomb, and you need to learn as a beekeeper how to see that they're growing, how to know when they're about to run out of space, and make sure that you give them adequate space because growth is, is a very natural, very normal uh, part of nature. It's kind of what we do, is, is grow and expand. Um, so honeybees are no different there. That's their whole job. So that life cycle of the whole colony is to, is to multiply just like individual bees do. So you've all heard of, everybody heard of a bee swarm? You guys ever seen one? 
a big ball of bees in a tree or on a forklift as a good example because we've seen one of those. Um, you know, that's, that's the way that the colony itself goes and multiplies. Um, that's, it's a natural thing for it to happen this time of year, especially when resources should be more abundant. Um, not this year. No rain, no honey. Expect prices to go up. Um, stock up now. We've got some for sale out front. Shameless plug. Um, it's delicious, I promise. Speaking of delicious honey, uh, my business partner, Audra, is back here. If you guys haven't met her yet, the lovely Audra. Audra has got uh, coffee stir sticks, and she's got five different kinds of honey. And I think she's going to find a way, maybe if you flip that carton upside down and use that to carry stuff, or just so you can pass them. If you can pass them, I don't know. Well, it might be easier. While I'll keep talking, and she'll bring them to y'all. However you want to do it, love. Start with springtime, and I'll walk around do springtime, and then we'll switch flavors. Yeah, sounds good. So we've got five different flavors, five different kinds of honey for you guys to sample so you can kind of see a little bit of the, uh, the spectrum of, of honey and see, you know, see how different it can be. Um, anybody know why honey tastes, one honey tastes different than another? Different, different pollen, different plants, yep. yep. So our, our bees, the same bees, will make different, very different flavors uh, even in the same spot from different season to season. Uh, we can pretty much always count on Biden's Alba being in there around here, thank goodness. Uh, so that's life cycle of a colony. Um, I have a question, I'm sorry. Go for it. How, how do you know, like, if it's the same colony but they're making different honeys? Like, do you watch them like, oh, I saw a girl on that one. <laughs> yeah. You can, there, there used to be one lab in the country that you could, one university lab that you could send your honey to and they could tell you exactly what, what was in it. Um, and they no longer do that. So we, we just know by knowing what's blooming uh, in a particular area at a particular time. Um, so the only way to guarantee that you're getting orange blossom honey is to make sure that there's nothing else for a three mile radius around your hive because bees will fly three miles out, three miles back to get something to eat. So if there's dozens of plants, uh, you can't say what it is. You, we just call it wildflower. Um, so you may have two to 10 to 30 different plants. In order to say that this is one variety, it just needs to be the only thing blooming you know, in a, in a six mile area. Good question. How long from like, so it's, it's orange, heart, you know, blooming time, how long until you're, you're harvesting orange blossom honey? It's, it's going to be, so with oranges, in, oranges specifically, it's probably four to six weeks, I, I, I think. Uh, and that just now finished up, so we've had to pull out uh, no rain, no honey. Uh, so our bees were actually starving in a yard where they should have been cranking out, you know, barrels of, of honey. Um, so we've, we've now moved them on to, um, to saw palmetto at a yard just across the lake, because um, those are just now starting to bloom. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll take more questions later on about different things, because I may get to some of this stuff, so I don't, I don't want it to be just, just question hour. Um, I've mentioned a couple times bacteria, fungus. Uh, there's also a number of, of predators and pests that we have to deal with. Um, some of those predators and pests are the reason that these diseases are able to, to get into the hive. Um, there's, there's a couple in particular that cause huge problems for beekeepers um, and are the majority of the reason why beekeepers struggle to keep their colonies going and why, you guys have heard of colony collapse disorder? It's been on the news for, I don't know, a decade or something like that. Um, largely that's bad beekeeping. Um, it's, that's a result of just bad practices and, and being attached to farms that have bad practices and monoculture and out there spraying a lot of harmful chemicals, um, for, forever chemicals that are bad for humans and, and bad for bees. Um, but the, the common, common predators, um, raccoons, bear, uh, mice, um, skunks, wasps, and hornets will get in there sometimes. Um, uh, not often will they, will they get in and uh, overrun a, a healthy colony, uh, but it does, it does happen. Um, 
Another predator of the uh, the honeybee we were talking about out front is the uh, the dragonfly. Um, so their dragonflies are are assassin bee assassins. They're, they're incredibly number. Um, pests. Um, there are three main pests that we deal with here in the U.S. Uh, one is the varroa mite, varroa destructor. Uh, the varroa mite uh, vectors in the majority of the diseases uh, that we that we deal with as beekeepers. Um, varroa mites can be tested for. It's one of the things that if you get into beekeeping and you don't test to look at and see if you guys have varroa mites in your hive, you will not be successful for long. Uh, you may enjoy a good season or two, but eventually those mites will find uh, and they will vector in disease and, and your, your bees will, will suffer for it. And the way that we do that test is by putting rubbing alcohol into one of these containers and we take a frame that has bees on it and it has to be brewed. No bees in here, it's okay. So we take a frame, we take this cap off, and we roll this down the backs of the bees and they just fall in. And unfortunately we have to kill about 100 bees every time we do this test, which is why we don't do it all the time. Then you shake it and wait, and all the mites come to the bottom. So when those mites come out, we're able to count. And if we have more than eight mites per 100 bees, it's time to treat our bees with any number of substances that the bees don't like. Um, some of those are man-made chemicals, um, the same things that pest control companies might use to control other pests um, in and around your house. Uh, they've just been tested to not kill the bees but, but hurt the mites and knock them back. Um, and uh, some of those can be just essential oils. But if you guys want to pass this around, um, there's little black specks in here. And the little black specks are Varroa destructor. You guys want to pass it around? You want to look? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and pass it to the next person we ever done. So the mites are the little black specks. So Varroa destructor is our, our number one enemy. Um, second, but, but way less of an issue, if you, if you research what they do to prevent it in Australia, and do that. It's not legal in the US, uh, but if you happen to research that and do what they do in Australia, you won't have a problem with it, but it is small hive beetle is enemy number two. Um, and that, they can make a mess if there's a lot of pollen in your hive and you don't have enough bees to control them. So low bee count, lots of pollen, beetles move in, they lay their larvae in that pollen and it turns to a black sludge um, and then your bees are, are screwed. Uh, and, they'll, and they'll leave and it'll happen really, really quickly. That can happen in three, four days. Uh, the other one is wax moths. If your hive dies or you get a low bee count, you've got all this space. As I, I mentioned earlier, the hive grows and the, and the colony shrinks. If the population of bees shrinks inside of that space and the bees are not able to control all of their vermin, all the pests that are putting pressure on them, then the pests are able to overcome. And one of those pests that moves in at night is called the, uh, the wax moth. Any, any guesses as to what that might be looking for and eating? Wax. Surprising thing is that it will also, let me see if I can find one here. I think I, think I snagged one. Yeah. This has also got poorly, poorly drawn comb, which is something else that can be prevented by using different equipment. But I'll pass this around as well. Um, and what you're looking for, you may be able to see from where you are, is there's all these notches and kind of holes eaten and, and dug into the wood itself. So once those wax moths are done eating wax, they will continue to eat and they will eat into the wood of your hive this box here that you can probably, probably be easier for y'all to just come up and look later. But this is, they actually ate into the side of the box itself. This equipment isn't cheap. Um, so if you don't keep your bees, I mean, the bugs will come in and, and eat it. I don't know if it's the same thing. I have no idea. 
Yeah, it could be. They don't look delicious to me, but lizards may may appreciate them. Yeah. So the other the other problem with this frame is that the bees got a little uh, I don't know you know what they were drinking that day, but they didn't draw the the comb straight down the middle. Um, they were a little bit off center when they started making this this foundation or drawing out this comb, and they drew it out a little crooked. And if that's in between two other sheets of comb that are drawn straight, and that's what we want is nice straight comb so we can pull them, you know, pull them out. We're playing a game of operation every time we do this. If the queen bee happens to be sitting on a piece of honeycomb and you go pulling this thing out and you're not, you're wiggling all over the place, you could very easily kill your queen bee. Um, so we want this to be nice and straight for, for obvious reasons. Sometimes the bees get it wrong. Um, what allowed this to happen is that this was a foundationless frame. There was nothing for the bees to start on. Uh, this probably came from, we, we bought out a couple of other beekeepers that were getting out of it. Um, so as we buy equipment, we get some of it that's damaged like this. And um, the way that you can prevent that is by starting with a frame that has a piece of plastic foundation in it that already has that hexagon pattern in there. Uh, and that's perfectly straight and it stops our honeycomb from getting slung out when we're extracting honey. It's, it's way, way, way nicer to start with this than it is to just let the bees do their own thing. Bees don't like plastic. They don't want to touch it. So one of the ways that you can get around that is by heavily coating that with, with hot wax before you give it to them. Uh, that, that wax that you put on there, they will remodel it and start off with comb. Um, I'm not going to pass these, these around, uh, but you can come up and eyeball them later on and check them all out uh, afterwards and I'll, I'll point out to anybody who's curious to learn more um, what exactly we're looking at here. Uh, there's a number of frames in here that have got uh, examples, um, different examples of, of, of things that went wrong uh, and things that went right. Um, there's a number of of, so some of the diseases that are, are vectored in are fungal. Um, there's also bacteria and fungi that are beneficial to bees. So the, um, there's lactobac you know, lactobacillus is good for bees. So we actually give our bees probiotics just like you would give uh, your kids uh, or, or eat yourself. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the biology, the, the social networking, you know, that's going on, their communication, the diseases, all the things, that, all the biology that's going on with these crazy critters. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, so why keep them? Uh, in permaculture, what's, what's the first thing we want to do? And then we want to obtain a yield, yeah? Yeah? So obtain a yield as quickly as you can. Um, so what are our yields from honeybees? Honey, what else? Wax. Pollination. Pollination. Propolis. Um, pollen, yeah, pollen itself. Uh, I'm going to add alcoholic beverages to that, which is, you know, kind of a, you know, a little step away, but mead. Uh, royal jelly is another one. Um, and opportunities for education. I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one in. Um, why, why shouldn't you keep bees? Um, if you're, if you're allergic, probably not a good idea. Um, it's a huge commitment. It's, it can be pretty expensive as far as hobby goes. The, the, your first taste of honey um, will, will cost you hours and hours and probably about $2,000 in equipment and bees before you even start. Um, so there's, there's good reasons not to. Sometimes local regulations will stop you from doing it. Um, some of us don't care. Um, but, uh, but, there are, but there are rules that say you need to have your hives so far away from um, a property line. Uh, you're not allowed to have any more than you know, this, this number of colonies, depending on the time of year. Um, so it's not really suitable for, for everyone. Um, it is time consuming, uh, not just going into the hives every week to 10 days. Um, it's not just that. That can be pretty quick and, and painless. Uh, sometimes it's not so painless. Um, I could write a uh, dissertation uh, on how to get stung 
and, and all the different colors you see when it happens. Um, it's, it's pretty, some of them are impressive. Um, but that, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't stop you by itself. Uh, so how to get started is uh, you got to learn skills. Uh, you need to take some classes. You need to find a mentor. Um, get around them a little bit before you before you even decide to have your own. Um, from there, uh, be aware of all the the cost or the, uh, the the easy ways to fail. Um, and I've got a long list that I made up, and I'm just going to read them because uh, I don't have this all memorized. But uh, not learning enough about beekeeping. Uh, pr not providing adequate food and water. Uh, when, you, when you install a colony, the bees are not good. They're not, they're not able to take care of themselves right away, usually. So you do need to feed them. And I'll get into what we feed them here in a second. Quick pause, Jason. Yeah. Tupelo. That's Tupelo. Uh, last one's Tupelo. Sweet as Tupelo, honey. I'm not going to sing it for you all. Um, assessing the health of a colony based on the amount of traffic coming and going out of the front door is something that people do. You have to open it up. You have to look. Not recognizing queenlessness. Uh, not managing pests and diseases. Um, uh, not wearing protective clothing or, or using your smoker uh, is another mistake that, that some of us make. We think that we're fine to just, uh, it's hot out, it's Florida, I'm just going to use, you know, my, I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I don't feel like putting my veil on. I don't feel like popping smoke. You should probably do all those things because um, it, it can make you not want to go and, and touch them again if you get a real bad day. I think my worst, my worst day to date was about 40 stings. Uh, and they were like, you know, getting up my pants and everything. It was a bad day. Um, and because we're, we're out there trying to move hives, you know, get them on a truck and, and get them out of one place and get them to another, just leaving was not an option. You just kind of had to like go, oh, this, this sucks, and, and keep going. Um, my partner TJ, he's, he's had it a lot worse than that. Um, has also been bitten by our bear fence once good enough to make him just fall over. Uh, failing to learn from experienced beekeepers. Oh, starting with one colony. This is why I write this stuff down. You can't start with just one colony. Um, or you can, but your, your chances of success go up a lot if you have colonies to share. You're able to take bees out of one box and put them in another. So if one's weak, you can bolster and you can strengthen that one by taking from the other one, as long as it's strong too. Uh, how am I doing on time? I don't know how long I'm supposed to go on. Like I said, I could stand up here for like two weeks straight, uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to keep you guys. I mentioned feeding bees earlier, um, so we've got to learn. You got to learn equipment. You got to learn how to feed and when to feed. Uh, the equipment that's involved, I guess I should back up and start there. The equipment that's involved, this is a Langstroth style hive. Um, Langstroth figured out bee spacing. He figured out how much space a bee needs to move around and to pass. And if you go less than what a bee can do, they'll make propolis and they'll fill that hole and plug it up. If you give them more than that amount of space, they make wax, and they'll put wax everywhere that they have more than a certain amount of space. So understanding bee space is very, very important. And Langstroth nailed it. Um, and this is, a, this is a standard size box. And because everything is standard, it slides in and out nice and easy. There is commercially available extraction equipment that you can use. When it comes time to uncap the honey to get the honey out of the comb, the knife works just right on this. If you get, uh, anybody heard of a top bar beehive? Mm -hmm. So there's different styles of hives out there. If you get a top bar hive, chances are that your bar isn't going to fit in a, in a centripetal or centrifugal uh, extraction machine. And if it does fit in there, when it starts slinging around, it's gonna sling the, co the comb off inside your machine and make a huge mess. It's hard to clean up. Um, so I highly recommend going with this style of hive to start. You have a lot of other stuff to learn. Um, don't try to be a scientist and get experimental right off the bat. I don't recommend trying to be a natural beekeeper um, and, and stay away from all the, the, the chemicals and all that. I think that, again, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure if you fail to follow the recommendations for a little while. Once you have a handle on it, 
experiment, have fun, uh, but keep a close eye. Um, so bottom board is on the bottom. And that's, that's what most hobbyist beekeepers are gonna start with is some, some version of a bottom board that has an entrance in it. The entrance is not built into the box itself. It's just built right down here in the bottom. And when the box sits on top, it leaves an opening. That opening width can be changed in width. Some of them run all the way across. Um, there are feeders, little jars and inserts that you can plug into that that will allow them to get some syrup, some sugar syrup. Um, and I'll get into the other style of feeders. I don't have one of those to show you, but it's basically just a mason jar on top of a piece of plastic or wood. It screws in and you can slide it into a, a notch on the front. So box, I've got, this is called a, a deep box. And this is called a medium. There is a shallow that's a, a, little, bit, a little bit less in height. Uh, I mentioned scaling the hives based on the amount of bees in the hive. We scale the hive. If my, if my bees, half of them leave, and I notice that there's a low population, then I take this away. If there's, if there's brood and resources in here that's, that I, we can use for another colony, then I'll give it to another colony. But if there's not a lot of bees in here, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make sure that they have a small space to heat, a small space to cool, small space to defend. Um, and I'm limit the actual space that they have available. If they're really, really cranking, then I'm able to, to give them more space. I'm able to give them a fresh frame with fresh foundation that's coated with wax. Um, give them all new frames. Maybe feed them depending on the time of year, maybe not, and let them draw all that wax out. That's one of the most valuable things. That's the other problem with the other styles of beehives is that to, to harvest that honey, you're pretty much gonna have to take that wax out. You're gonna have to crush it with the honey inside and smash the honey out and then strain the, ha the wax out of the honey. You can render that wax down and keep it just like you can when I cut off wax cappings. Um, but you're, um, you're gonna be destroying all that wax and the bees work five times harder or so to make wax than they do to make honey. So if you destroy a pound of wax, you shot yourself in the foot and you took away your ability to get five more pounds of honey the following year or the following season. So wax is very important. Uh, the other thing that while we're on that subject, you have to learn to preserve that wax. If you leave an empty box with wax like this sitting in the shade somewhere, put a cover on top of it, what do you think is gonna move in and destroy your wax? Wax, wax moth. And they'll come in and again, they will eat your wax, they will eat your frames, they will eat your boxes, um, and leave you probably feeling pretty upset when you come back to it. Um, so it's important to learn how to protect it uh, before you get started and to make sure that you have space. Uh, to kill those wax moth and varroa mites and beetles, we put them in a freezer for a little while. You know, it takes a couple days in a freezer to kill off all the stages from eggs all the way through adults of any of those pests. Um, after that, I have a big walk-in refrigerator that I built out of a box truck um, and uh, an AC unit and a cool bot. Uh, works really, really well. Um, the other method is to wrap them up and use, uh, Audrey, what's it called, that wax? I can't remember. There's, a, there's like a, a, a crystalline, it's like a powder that you put on top. I can't remember what it's called right now. But we put that uh, up on top and it's a really, really nasty smelling stuff. Um, and it, it just basically sucks the oxygen out of the room. I don't know what kind of chemical reaction is going on, but the stuff is horrible to be around. Uh, so I prefer to use my walk-in refrigerator um, and stay away from that, that chemical in particular. Um, more equipment. Queen excluders. If I, let's say we're going into spring, there's lots of flowers blooming, I'm gonna get honey. I've got a lot of bees in here. I need to keep my queen out of part of this so that I can get honey without having a bunch of baby bee eggs and larvae crawling around in my honey. Um, some honey tastes better than others because they just leave the larvae out. Some honey operations, cheap honey, they just extract the larvae right along with the, with the honey if it happens to be in there. So some honey, I mean, all, not all honey is equal, I should say. In order to keep the queen out, um, we use what's called a queen excluder. 
Uh, the spacing on these metal bars is just enough that a worker bee can get through here, but a queen bee cannot. She can't get that big booty through. There's a correct way to put this on. Up is always up. And then you take your honey super, your next box, and put it up on top. Load it up with frames. Take your lid, put your lid on, and come back and, and check in a week or two. Sometimes if you've got drawn comb in there, uh, you've got so you have honeycomb drawn out and they're not building that, you can come back and find one of these things chock full of wax or uh, honey rather in less than a week. Um, it's been a rough year. Things that can ruin that for you are hurricanes. Um, ask us in the fall time, it was pretty bad. Um, a lot of guys lost their colonies altogether because they were in low-lying areas. So thankful we didn't have that issue, but it shut the trees down, the flowers went away, the bees stopped collecting nectar pretty much immediately. Um, right now I mentioned orange blossom, no rain, no honey. Um, so everybody pray for rain. Our plants need it too. Uh, there's another style of queen excluder that is plastic. Um, we have a couple because we got them from another operation, but I don't recommend them. Um, the sun can bake the corners. UV light ruins the corners on these. They go bad faster, they're floppy, they lay on top of your frames uh, and, and can generally make a mess. Uh, feeding, I mentioned feeding, so the equipment required to do that uh, is either one of those entrance feeders, you've got to have one of those. Another option that I'll show you guys when you come up is a, a feeder frame that sits down inside. You have to pop your hive open, fill it up with sugar water, um, or that and a mixture of that and corn syrup. Or you can use what we do, we have one gallon buckets we put a paint tint plug, you know, you pull these things out of the top of your, uh, your paint cans all the time. So we use that for a fill hole and we have three small holes punched on top. You pull a cap out of the top, there's a big hole in the middle, and we just dump it up on upside down like that. And they've got a gallon of sugar water. Um, sometimes they suck it down in a week, sometimes it takes them two. Um, other equipment, uh, safety stuff, jackets. Uh, I don't wear a jacket like this usually unless it's cold out, uh, just for extra warmth. Uh, even then, I'll probably still just wear a hoodie. Um, I prefer to wear a hat and a nice light veil, so I just wear a long sleeve shirt. They rarely get me through the shirt, even if it's just one layer thick, uh, which is pretty cool of them. Um, these guys, these vented jackets are three layers thick. It's very unlikely that you will get stung through this unless you, you know, have got a gap at your wrist and you're doing a lot of things wrong. Um, along with that, you've got heavy gloves. I don't tend to wear these either because it makes me awful clumsy. Um, so these big thick gloves make it difficult to feel what you're doing. You're very likely to start smashing bees. You start smashing bees, they get upset, they start stinging you. Um, and it's, it's nice to just be able to feel what you're doing and be gentle about it. Uh, sometimes, if I get stung a lot, I'll take just a pair of rubber gloves. And we found these Venom something or other brand that are white on the inside. So we flip them inside out, now we have white gloves. Uh, bees don't like dark colors. Um, they're, they're made to defend themselves against mammals. It's mammals that their stinger breaks off in. Um, other, other insects, um, you know, a, a, a frog, a lizard, whatever, they can sting those critters multiple times and the, the barbs don't catch. Um, the other thing that we use a lot is a hive tool. Uh, there are a couple different styles. I don't think I yeah, I did. So I've got two different styles right now. And you can see that there's a little bit of difference. This one's got a, a, a bend in the top. I prefer this style. Some people prefer this style. There's three or four other styles. You choose the one that feels good in your hand. Uh, beekeepers will tell you that this is wrong and that's wrong. Do what you like. So hive tools are used for Scraping, prying these boxes get stuck together because bees make propolis and propolis is, is glue. They, they connect, or collect that from trees um, in the form of sap and resin. Um, so we use that to, to pop in between our two boxes and then, and then pry our boxes apart um, to get them unstuck. We also use them to pry the frames out. Um, extraction stuff. We use big knives to cut our cappings off, and this is possible with a Langstroth 
style hive. Um, so this we use to just cut down one side, cut the cappings off, and then we can put it into our spinner and spin the honey out. Uh, other styles to get the cappings off are these little forks where you have to like kind of pry and pick at them. Um, they are effective. I think they're kind of a pain in the butt if you're going to do it a lot. But if you have one hive, then it's perfectly fine. Uh, when you go to strain your honey, you're going to want to be able to get the wax and the honey separated. So we've, you're going to want to have a couple different styles of strainers possibly. Uh, if you're going to render your own wax, um, which is probably my least favorite thing to do, um, then you'll also want to have some, uh, they almost look like coffee filters, but they're, but they're made for, uh, for filtering wax. So it's a big, big, uh, big coffee filter. And then you're going to want to have five gallon buckets that have a way to empty the bucket without having to pour it back out of the top. Um, so that's the other piece of the puzzle when it comes to getting your honey out of the hive. Um, so we talked about the boxes, we got the lids. Uh, we make ours out of PVC board. Um, we do sell those. Uh, the, the bees, because they don't like plastic, they're less likely to put stuff all over it, which is kind of nice. Uh, they're not going to rot in our humidity down here, which is really nice. Uh, you could probably drive over these with your truck and they probably wouldn't break. I wouldn't recommend it, but, um, but, they're, but they're sturdy and they'll last you a lifetime where, where a wooden lid um, will rot or need, or need maintenance and need to be painted over and over and over again. Um, working with plastic sucks sometimes, but sometimes it's, it's, a, good, it's a good answer and a good solution. Uh, the other important thing is uh, having a smoker and learning how to light it. Um, so this is, this is a very, very important piece of equipment that we never start without. Um, and we use pine needles and pine pellets when we start uh, our day each and every day, which is why we named our company Pine Smoke, because that's, that's literally the first thing we do is pop smoke. Um, so that, that, lovely, that lovely burned pine needle smell uh, is, the, uh, is the way we start the day. Uh, it all starts with pine smoke. So uh, that's, that's about it. Um, if you guys have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'll stand here for, for an hour answering questions, but I imagine some of you will have to, to leave. Uh, you're welcome to, while that's happening, you're welcome to come in and check out the bees closer up. Um, he, you know, this gentleman here is recording for YouTube, so if you do come up, uh, try not to talk over those of us who are asking and answering questions, um, but you're welcome to. I, I was told this is a really laid back group uh, and we're pretty informal, so I'm happy to let you guys just kind of do whatever. So Jason, when it comes to extracting the honey or doing any type of extraction of any materials, are you doing it all yourself on site? Are there local people who help out and maybe have that equipment, so let's say if mm -hmm. you wanted to get started, maybe there's a, a place where you can go. Absolutely. Um, so there are businesses that, that that's their sole purpose. Um, it, and they may not work with you if you are a hobbyist, uh, but maybe a, a smaller unit like Pine Smoke Bee Company, um, we, we're willing to to do extractions. It's one of the things that we'd like to do is actually kind of pool all the beekeepers in the area. Um, and it makes sense to, to do a lot of honey at one time, not one box and then put up, put all your stuff away. Um, so it's something we've been kind of playing with the idea of is, is doing, you know, having an entire group of people just make a batch of honey together. Um, so there are companies that do it. Um, wax, wax rendering, if you save up a bunch of wax, you can take it to um, a, a larger apiary so they can render it for you. Uh, that's what we do. I, I have no interest in doing it myself. Uh, the rest of the process we are doing. So we are going out to the field, collect, taking our boxes off, taking them back to our honey house, um, cutting the wax off, spinning it out, you know, and then setting, when you're done with that, then you take your empty frames and you set them back outside next to your bee yard uh, and the bees will come and just clean that, clean that wax up for you. So then you can store it in your, your fridge or your freezer. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. When you go to move your hives, 
Um, is there a time of day that you do it? Do you do it at night time? Not, yeah. Do not leave a bee behind? Yeah, <laughs> great. It's, a, it's a great question. Um, yes, there is. Uh, we do that either early morning uh, before the sun comes up or we do it just at sunset. Uh, the bees will come home at night um, and once they're all in there, so we don't leave any behind uh, because we do want full strength when we get them to their, no, their new spot, um, we, we move them at night. So we uh, plug their door up so that they, they don't come flying out when we're going down the road. Um, and then uh, once we get there, then we, we pull. That's the last thing we do before we tuck tail and run. All that vibration um, makes for a lot of angry bees. So if you've got, um, you know, our, one, our, one of our yards is 48 colonies of bees um, that are stacked, you know, two or three boxes high. And when you shake them around for about an hour, it, it really uh, it gets them going. So we, we pull, foam, the pull the foam out of the door and then we run, basically, pretty much. <laughs> Anybody else? Just pull the, you pull the foam out as soon as you get them in place? No, we wait until we get them all in place oh. and then we run around and pull all the foam out at one time and then jump in the truck and, and, head, and run for the hills. Vibration may make them irritated. Mm -hmm. What if you sing to them soothingly? Does that calm them down? They like Sinatra the most. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't noticed that they get calm from that. I have noticed that if you are, you're, you know, maybe you're having a bad day, you're, you're feeling a little irritated, agitated, and you're, maybe you're in a hurry, you're just trying to get the job done, it's, you know, it's, it's hot, you're getting stung, ugh. If, you're, if your energy gets frustrated and, you know, you get all pent up, you know, and, and, and you start fidgeting and fussing and moving fast, and you gotta like, they, they will teach you to just go, oh yeah, ah, let, me, let me relax, chill out, move slow, take it easy. Uh, sing Sinatra to myself so I don't bother my coworkers, um, and then things go a little bit better. You stop getting stung. Um, the other kind of vibrations that are uh, a pretty bad idea to bring to a beehive is mowing your lawn, weed eating, driving by them with your diesel truck or your tractor. That stuff pisses them off pretty quick. Um, so you and they will they will just fly out of nowhere and they will go for your face. That's 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 what they go for. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive um, how accurate they are and how fast they can fly, which is about 15 miles an hour, by the way. Um, Good. Do you come across uh, bee hobbyists that do it for the pollination only and not the honey? I don't come across a whole, whole lot of hobbyists myself. TJ would be a better person to ask that question, too. Most hobbyists that I, I think I've talked to are into it for the honey aspect. Um, but again, I, I haven't hung out with a whole, whole lot of hobbyists yet. Um, I went straight from an engineering job to doing this as a profession. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time in the workshop, maintaining equipment, building new equipment, uh, building jigs and fixtures to make building that equipment faster and more efficient because it's, it's my chosen business now, so I need to, to do all the businessy things that I've got to do. Which is one of the things that I love about beekeeping is that you get an opportunity to, if you're into woodwork, you have plenty of opportunities for it. If you're a tinker, an inventor, if you're an exper you know, if, if you love to experiment, and, you know, you have an, you have lots of opportunities to do that. Aside from getting to hang out outside, and then just enjoy your day, and and be constantly fascinated, and you, you never you, you just can't be curious enough to know it all. Um, with with bees, so it's a it's a it is a fantastic. I, there's kind of started off with you know probably don't do this, but they're fascinating, um, and it's it's very very enjoyable to get into this and to just if you like to be busy and you like to learn, uh, you probably couldn't pick a better hobby um, because it just goes so deep and so wide, and there's so much stuff to tinker with and play with and things to make and do. Uh, so it's it's. Pretty pretty awesome hobby. Uh, in the in the back first. Do you guys sell uh, colonies or nukes? What's that? Do you guys sell colonies or nukes? We do sell nukes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. So set up like you have right here. How much honey do you get from it, and how often? 
It depends. So sometimes you don't get any. Um, we haven't been able to harvest honey for six months, and we have a hundred of these, um, and and a whole room full of extra stuff sitting around waiting to be deployed on top of our colonies when the time comes, so that we can continue to stack up and stack up and make our colonies bigger and bigger and bigger. Sometimes you'll have five of these honey supers on top of one colony filled with honey and we're able to harvest about 40 pounds per box. So when you've got 48 colonies or, or 4,000 colonies, like a lot of big commercial beekeeping operations will have several thousand colonies to maintain um, and they're able to, uh, to, to move a lot of of honey in a year, or create a lot of honey in a year, or harvest, I should say. So, so is that drought? Huh? Is What's that, ma'am? Drought? Right, right now, with the orange trees, we think it was drought. Uh, they could have been stressed out by the hurricanes, but it's very likely that it's it's just no no rain. So. Uh, it depends on where you put your bees and what exactly you're going after. In Florida, you can harvest usually three times, sometimes four times in a year. Um, and it really depends on, you can, you can do it more if you're in a, in, a, in a small area and you know that there's a lot of one type of plant and you want that specific flavor. You might choose, and you know, let's say it only, it only blooms for a week, then you're gonna wanna pull your honey right after that week. Because the next week, if something else starts to bloom, you're not going to get that one flavor. So you might choose to do it, you know, very, very, very often. Okay. Jeff. Kind of tailing off what Banks was talking about, and let's say that I'm doing, let's say that I do bees because I not only want honey, but I also want to pollinate my yard. I get all these flowers. Yeah. And I have fruit trees. Uh huh. And then you're saying that. You know, you want your bees to go out to the orange grove or maybe the soft meadow. Someone told me that they're going to be going a few miles away. They will. And they might not spend as much time pollinating my garden. Is that, what do you, what have you observed? It's, it's possible. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really hard to put a leash on a bee and figure out exactly where they go in a day. But um, they, I know that they, they certainly appreciate having a lot of variety. Um, that gives them a lot better chance nutritionally. Uh, the, their, their diet, the nutrition available in their diet is very, very important. Um, any, anybody like almonds? Um, anybody aware that millions and millions and millions of bees every year are put on semi-trucks and shipped from all over the country to California just to pollinate almond trees? Anybody ever taste almond honey? It's disgusting. <laughs> um, you, want, you want nothing to do with it. On top of that, there's absolutely no nutritional value in that for the bees. Um, so if they don't have other stuff planted for the bees to eat, the bees come back from California uh, in rough shape. They may not be starving, uh, but they don't like that honey. They'd much rather eat something else, which is why all of those almond tree growers go through and cut everything else down right before, right before season. Um, but it's, that's the Super Bowl of beekeeping. That's, that's where you get a, a big, and because of that, uh, they, they have to pay a lot of money for a beekeeper to put their bee on that piece of property. Um, so that, that's one of our income streams as beekeepers is pollination services. Um, so we're not just doing it for our own gardens. If, you've got a, if you have a big orchard, and you need bees, and you're not a beekeeper, um, then you gotta you gotta pay to have somebody move them and bring them out. Yes, sir. So, does honey go bad? And if it goes bad, how long can you store it for under ideal conditions? Sometimes, <laughs> honey can go bad, uh, and the way that it goes bad is by having too much water, too much moisture in the honey when it was bottled. Um, honey is hydroscopic. Anybody not know what that means? Honey, honey it attracts and absorbs water. So if you leave honey bottle or honey jar open in a human environment, it will pull water in and eventually it will self-ferment. 
um, and it may not be as delicious as the fermented beverage that that we love called mead. Um, so it's you know it's good to keep your bot your honey sealed up tight. If the moisture content is below 18 percent, and we use we use a device to measure that to make sure. Um, although it's it's sometimes it's it's again sometimes sometimes it's easy to tell if the uh, if the moisture content is is correct or not. What we do. Right before, once we, once we uncap, so we take our uncapping knife, uh, this doesn't have caps on it, so use your imaginations. We take our capping knife, we cut all the cappings off of this. So now it's open like this and we can see that there's, there's honey inside. We take it like this and we go If anything comes out, too wet, we don't get to harvest it. Uh, if it sticks in there, then the moisture content is very likely just fine and we can harvest away. Too much water, auto fermentation, bad honey. Aside from that, it'll last thousands of years. Um, if it crystallizes inside of your jar and, and turns into, you see chunks in there, and it's not just wax chunks, but the honey itself crystallizes, um, you can reflow that by putting it into some hot water. Or here in Florida, you could probably put it in your, your car on a hot summer day. Uh, don't leave it too long because it won't be raw anymore. You need to keep it below 110 to, to call it raw. Um, but uh, you can reflow that honey so those crystals will melt if you warm it up gently. That's what my neighbor's doing. Yeah. Uh, so I walk outside and there's these like jars of honey on his back porch. And I'm like, what is that? Yeah. Like, you know, I've had to do that with a 55 gallon drum uh, that got like, <laughs> got like crystallized inside. Um, no, uh, but over time it will. Oh, okay. So, and all it takes is. Um, What's happening to make it crystallize? Uh, I know that the, the ratio of, of uh, sucrose to fructose will affect, and different honeys have different ratios of sucrose and fructose. Um, so. Because I've seen some videos on uh, making whipped honey from crystallized honey. Yeah, and you, well, you want to start with crystallized honey when you're making whipped honey. Right. Um, some of that will reflow back into honey depending on exactly how you did it. There, yeah, there's different methods to do that. Um, I haven't made it myself. I'm not an expert in that, but I know that if you do it with certain techniques mm -hmm. and you start with some correctly whipped honey, like a, a basically like a mother, you know, if you start with a good seed, um, it, that it will somehow continue out from there. So I'm, I'm not sure of all the exact methods. Yes, sir. The, the ones that chew on the beehives themselves are called wax moths. Oh, what, wax moths? Yep. So they come in at night um, whenever there's no bees around. Oh, is the one that you have in the jar all of them? In here? Oh, in the little jar with the cap, these guys? Those are called my, varroa mites. Varroa mites. They're not chewing on the wood. Uh, the varroa mites are, for a long time, we thought that varroa mites were, were sucking the blood from the bees, but it turns out that they're actually trying to eat their fatty bodies. Uh, and their favorite spot is the bee's liver. Um, and then they also get down into the brood and, and, um, and eat on the developing liver on the larva. Um, so that's why when we're doing a test, you specifically have to get the bees off of the brood. So lots, like I said, lots to know with this stuff and you have to know all the details to do it well. Uh, other questions, anybody else? Yeah, um, so Biden's alba is always always popping off, right? So the more we the more we plant that blossoms regularly, the more that, you know you you can ensure that they're going to have something to eat. If you're like me and you have a lot of bee colonies on a single piece of property, um, they may eat more than those plants and can can produce. So they're still going to want to fly three miles to go find food. 
Um, as long as there's native forage around, and that's the other thing that you, you, you can learn is about the native plants that are in the areas and then kind of kind of peep around your area and check, check out empty lots, um, just undeveloped areas that have got a lot of saw palmetto and pine and things like that. You usually have a lot of other plants in there um, that, that have got blossoms that they can get nectar and pollen from. Uh, nectar and pollen, I didn't mention this earlier, is their primary foods. So the nectar, it's their carbohydrate, and pollen is their protein and fat source, so uh, primarily protein. So it's good, good stuff for them. And we've got to make sure they have a good balance of both. Water sources too, uh, so that in our yep. the rocks and so they can land and Yep, in. also important. Yep, yep, I usually just dump a bunch of pine needles you know, into a bin or a bucket of water. And as the water level drops, they can they can kind of climb down the pine needles and yeah. So they got plenty of stuff to hold on to, so they don't slip in and drown. So how do they actually make the honey? They? Yeah, that's getting deeper into biology than I thought I was going to be tonight. Um, it is not bee vomit. They have enzymes in their body. They've got a, a separate. I can't remember the, the, the words for this stuff. Um, I'm still kind of new at this. Um, so forgive me for, for not being a, a bee biologist here, but they have um, a, a sac, a kind of a, like a stomach that's not a stomach that that nectar goes into. Um, and then there's enzymes in their body when they, when they spit that back out into uh, the, the cells, the enzymes in there, along with them flapping their wings and creating heat and ventilation, they actually move air through the colonies. Um, so that action takes some of the water out and hardens that honey. And then the enzyme does its thing to transform that nectar and all the little bits of pollen that are in there into, uh, into honey. So this general idea. More than one bee to fill a little cell? Yes. Um, I've, I've got the, the fun bee fact on exactly how much one bee makes in their entire life somewhere buried in here. Um, and as you guys are poking around this thing later on trying to find the queen, hopefully before the sun gets down because it gets hard with less light, um, I'll, I'll start rattling off a bunch of bee facts later and that one's, that one's buried in there somewhere. Any other questions? Do uh, bees wear pants and they're called pollen pants? <laughs> that is, that's how they get their, uh, their pollen home. Yep. Other people with bees, like in the same area, like taken from the same crop. Sometimes. You know, someone could, you know, hey, I need bees to pollen make something. Yeah, sometimes. Twenty hives over. You know? Yeah, some beekeepers can be very, very territorial. Some can be nasty okay. and mean about it uh, because you're you, you. Whether you actually are or not, if there's a perception that you're stealing from them, people can get nasty, right? Uh, the beekeeping, professional beekeepers are like, not, not entirely like, but somewhat like the, uh, the guys on Deadliest Catch. They'll sit down and they'll have beers with you and they'll collaborate and they'll give you ideas and, and try to help you fix your problems. But if you go setting your bees right in their backyard, you know, beekeeper Joe may, uh, you know, oops, yeah. oops. <laughs> oh, sucks that a bear got in there, man. Yeah. So um, that kind of stuff happens among among bad people, um, just like it does in any other community out there. Um, and some people, this is very valuable stuff. You know, it takes, it takes the bees a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time to maintain them in order to build enough honeycomb so that we can have good harvests. That's what we work hard at now, is making more bees and getting them to make more wax and trying to find the balance between, well, do we want wax, do we want more honeycomb, or do we want to have some honey to sell? Or, you know, we want to sell some of our nukes from some of our, our baby bee colonies and get some money for that. Or do we want to hold on to those and let them grow up and then split them again into more and more and more colonies? So there's, it's all for us as a growing apiary, it's all about finding balance um, and, and about staying away from nasty beekeepers and thieves. So we, we don't advertise the location of our bee yards for that reason because this stuff is is very valuable. Like I said, just getting started with a couple of hives and a couple of bee suits cost you a couple grand. You got another question? I did, but I forgot what it was. Okay. If you remember, you let me know. I'm getting old. You know. <laughs> yeah, me too. Do you have to move your bees 
I mean, like, can you keep them on your acreage? You can keep them on your acreage with absolutely no problem. Uh, the bees probably prefer it because they don't like to be disturbed. Uh, they just want to do their own thing. So leaving them in one spot in some ways is better, but sometimes there's nothing for them to eat. And so you have to learn the signs of when they're out of food and when to feed them and know how to feed them and how much and how often and all that and just know, know how to keep an eye on that. But yes, you can leave them in one spot. You absolutely do not have to move them around. We do that because we're a small commercial operation um, and we are out chasing honey. If I want orange blossom honey, I gotta take my bees to it because I don't have an orange grove. If I want salt palmetto, I gotta take my bees to salt palmetto because I don't, I don't live in pine flatwoods you know, unfortunately in Florida. You know, if I, if I get a, a leased spot from uh, St. John's, you know, water management district to take my bees out and set them on St. John's land, which they do do to com with commercial operations, um, then I can go out there and, and um, my bees can feast on the Ocala National Forest or, or some other place. Is there any, I'm sorry. It's all good. Is there any, um competition between your high honeybees and the native bees? Is it detrimental? Fantastic question. Uh, so some people will say yes. Um, I think that they are likely running with their hypothesis without actually doing the research, if anybody tells you that that's the case. Um, there's actually been one study that I know of, high elevation, um, in Northern California, and I don't know exactly where, and I can't remember the lady's name, but they observed the native bee population. They did a lot of studying to figure out exactly what the health and the, the population was in a given area. Um, I, don't even, I can't even imagine trying to figure that out to begin with, but they did that work. And then they introduced uh, European honeybees and managed them for a period of time and then came back and checked the native bee population again, and there was absolutely no effect. Um, if there's a lot of forage available, I can see where that would be the case. If there's rampant development everywhere and all the farms and all the wild spaces are being cut down and we keep building you know, strip malls and gated subdivisions um, and we cut down all the natural native forage, then, then maybe competition becomes more of an issue for, for every critter in, in nature. Including the including the native bees, so plausible but hard to hard to prove one way or the other. Um, I heard just recently that like your your annuals and your flowers that you get that they don't produce the nectar and pollen that bees can actually. I don't know anything about those flowers, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. Audra, do you happen to know that? I, I'd have to do a little more studying. Um, I mean, I can certainly see where that might be the case, since most of your landscaping plants are chosen for that purpose, you know? Um, so I know that like, if you're planting your landscaping to be natives, or at least mostly natives, then at a minimum you know you're providing those plants for the native plants. And the honeybees also often like them as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would assume that perhaps that is the case, but I don't, don't quote me on that one. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me, though, since landscaping plants aren't chosen for their nutritive benefits. I was going to say, it really just kind of depends on, like, are they bred to produce flowers more than they should be naturally? The ones that are heavily bred to flower all year, they have to make up something so they don't put nutrients into it. So it's just those ones that are heavily bred for that purpose would probably be the ones I deploy because those are sterile. Yep. And if they're red flowers, there's less chance that bees are going to go to them in the first place. Bees can't see the color red. Another interesting little fact. Um, Jeff. Do you use propolis just for, for healing? Um, I, I've used it on cuts and various things as my first. Uh, antibacterial, yeah. but um, is it something that they produce a lot of? I know you're saying they're using it to seal yeah. um, the, the hives. Some, some colonies make more than others. Um, 
and there's there's so there's different. There's, it's all European honeybee, but there's different genetics within that. Um, there are different breeds of queens that we can buy to introduce different genetic traits and different behaviors uh, into our colonies. Um, so we may choose to go after, and this is a great one nowadays. We talk, I've talked about bacterial disease and varroa mites a lot and about how they attack the brood and they attack the livers on the bees. Very accurate little suckers. They can, they can jump from bee to bee while the bees are flying. I mean, they're, they're pretty amazing little critters. Um, and there's a new mite, uh, Troplelapsis, um, which is now, uh, it comes from Southeast Asia. It's spreading west slowly. Uh, when that mite, which is even smaller and even faster than varroa mites, when that hit Pakistan, it killed 100% of the bee population in the whole country. And that's, that includes their natives, not just the European honeybees. Um, so it is a terrifying, um, terrifying pest. And it's, it, it vectors in the same kind of diseases, but is e even harder to deal with. Uh, and no one is, we know it's coming, but you know, like... Buy your honey today. Yeah, like it's not going to go bad. Um, so uh, it's 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 really quite terrifying to uh, to, to see that coming west. Um, and what it's it's you know beekeepers moving things around largely that speeds that up. So large scale commercial beekeepers who are moving things around and shipping bees around the world are are partially, if not entirely, to blame for uh, for those kind of diseases spreading. So on that question, is there anything you can do to like? boost your hive's immune system? Um, like any specific? Yeah, um, so I mentioned probiotics earlier and about you know, how bees can benefit from, uh, from some bacteria and from some fungi, some uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and there are supplements that you can buy um, and give to them, that's something that we do. And it, it definitely helps them produce a lot more brood a lot faster. They get much healthier looking brood uh, much healthier looking young bees. It seems to help them recover from our somewhat harmful treatments um, that we're having to, to treat our, for, for mites and knock the mites back. So we do our test, we find more than eight mites per 100. We treat the whole yard, not the one hive, we treat them all. Uh, you treat your yard the same. It's not individual hives, it's not Steve, Tom, Kim, and Karen. It's it's a yard, uh, and you, you want them to be about equal in, in strength. So uh, did that answer your question? What was the, the question before that that I had? I'm not sure if I answered that one fully or correctly. Well, the propolis, do you, propolis. Do you use it yourself for, for I don't. Uh, treatment, or have you ever given it anyone asking for it? No. I mean, I use uh, honey itself for antibacterial yeah. properties. If, you, if I, I use that as my neosporin. Um, I've never made a tincture or anything from propolis. I'm sure I've got some in my mouth at some point. You know, it's, it's good stuff to have around. Some, some colonies, I kind of went out, there was my tangent. Some colonies make more than others. Yeah. Um, so we made it back up that rabbit hole. Um, how can someone classify their honey as organic, seeing as you can't control the location of the hives? Any organic honey uh, is an absolute lie. Um, you cannot control. Uh, there might be one apiary that I know of in the, all of the Americas um, that ha can produce organic honey because the guy is on an island in the middle of a remote area of Canada and the bees cannot get to anything else and there's, there's, there's no other farmland around there so it's all wild native forage. That guy could certify as organic. Um, if, if he hasn't already, I'm not, I'm not sure. The only other way that you might see that legally is because that honey has been imported from South America or maybe from Brazil specifically where they have lower standards for what they label as organic. And currently, it may have changed recently, but my understanding is that honey that comes from, or anything that comes certified organic from another country, the USDA will honor the organic label that comes from another country, even if it doesn't meet our standards. I believe that if they haven't already changed that, they're looking into doing so. Uh, but good, good question. There's really no way. So you, you can't certify it as organic, um, but we just gotta make sure we're not, uh, we're not sticking our bees, you know, right next to, uh, 
you know, large tree farms where they're spraying a lot, things like that, we've got to do our best to make sure that we, we really keep a close eye on where, what's around our bees. Um, at, us as a commercial operation because I'm selling this and I want to maintain high standards and, uh, and, and you know, be in, be in integrity when I say I'm selling a high quality product. So, but for you as a company to sell organic, you would have to, I'm sure, have the honey tested or? Yeah. There's not a whole lot of labs that'll do that. Yeah. Um, and the way that, that sort of my understanding of the way that that works is that when they certify your farm, they're certifying your farm, I think, more so than your product. I don't think they're doing, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, if you know, but I don't think they're doing testing on your vegetables. They come out to your farm to see if there's chemicals around. They check your soil. Can't really do that with bees. Um, so um, it, it would just take being able to prove that there's absolutely nothing around you for miles. So if you see organic honey, it... It shouldn't be certified organic, probably. I suppose it's possible. Maybe if the, if the farm, Sometimes. The bees, the bees can only go about three miles out, right? That's kind of where their, their limit is. Maybe five miles if they're really going for it. So if, maybe if you've got a 10 square mile, yeah. all of it's certified organic. But I, don't, I don't think that's likely. I don't think you're going to find that. Like I said, I, I know of, I think, one up in Canada uh, that they can prove that there's just, there's nothing else on the island. Uh, and there's, you know, it's surrounded by water for, for a couple of miles or something like that. Like, so there's very clearly, obviously, no way that there's pesticides getting to it. You remember your question? Yeah, do you uh, go after swans? We don't usually. That's a good way to, to get into this, is to go, go collect bees out of trees or cut them out of buildings. Um, if you do engage in cutting them out of buildings, I highly recommend that you find some kind of a waiver release form, you know, search online for some kind of a legal document to protect you from the property owner. This is a blame-oriented culture that we live in nowadays. So just protect yourself before you go uh, getting into agreements or arrangements with other people uh, other businesses especially, um, whether that's pollination or, or bee extraction or removal. Um, I, I don't even know that it's, you might have to be to do, I think they've changed it recently, but it was illegal for, for some time to do bee removals and extractions without being a certified uh, pest uh, expert or professional. Like you, you had to have your pest certificates to be able to do that. Uh, I believe now that they're allowing beekeepers to uh, to go in and, and, and do that now legally. Uh, I don't do that. Um, we like to control our genetics. Um, and we like to focus on, on making more of the bees that we already have. I don't want wild cards. Uh, bees that are in trees that have screwed off, that made a nest somewhere you know, around, or they're in somebody's roof. They may have a bunch of mites. Um, it may be Africanized genetics, so they may, they, they may tear me up. So there's just too many wild cards, it's too much time. I gotta charge somebody probably a minimum of 600 bucks to even, to even show up. Um, and nobody wants to pay 600 bucks to have their, their bees ripped out of their house. Pay anything. Exactly, yeah. so. Couple, probably a couple more, I don't know. And we'll shoot some light on this so you guys can try to find the queen. Okay. Um, when you when you um, bottle or jar your honey, what's the pros and cons of plastic bottles and jars besides the price? Uh, so I mean, the price of the, the container itself is is one thing. Um, using plastic, you know, especially one use plastics, really sucks. Uh, obviously, um, one of the ways that we want to hello. One of the ways that we want to to um, to kind of offset the amount of plastic that we have to use in this industry, because I've got plastic five-gallon buckets that I'm putting my honey in, and sometimes I've got to use plastic wrap for moving things around, and that just goes straight into the trash, and we've got all these plastic bottles. So I'll, I'll answer your question directly here in a second. But one of the one of the things that we really want to do is is make sure that a portion when we're when we're able, we don't have enough revenue right now, but 
every, every month, every year, we're going to be donating a portion of what we do to the Ocean Cleanup Project uh, to make sure that we're, we're paying it forward. And, um, and the other thing we'll be donating to the UF Honeybee uh, Research Lab to make sure that the, the research that protects these critters is, you know, continue to be funded. The difference in glass to plastic, it doesn't really affect the honey one way or the other. Um, I haven't noticed any difference in flavor myself. Honey's got a very strong flavor um, and it's going to be hard to overpower it with a food grade plastic. The thing that I like about plastic myself is that I can squeeze a bottle and get some out. Uh, you squeeze your glass jar hard enough um, and you just get a trip to the ER. So. Yeah, the weight of it. Uh, I don't want to ship glass because UPS and, uh, yeah, because reasons. Um, so we'll take one more question, but I will, I will add one thing to what you said earlier, Jason. Um, like, if you're adding honey, especially raw, you know, unfiltered honey, to anything you're making, like, to eat it, I always like when they're elderberry, wait till it gets below 110 to add that honey. Yeah. If you are trying to, you know, incorporate the benefits of the honey into what you're doing, maybe it's something that's been heated, please wait till it cools down or else yep. you're kind of... Losing either the bacterial or the viral component. Yep. So you're going to be you're going to be losing. You can change change the enzymes that are that are in there, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you you do want whatever whatever came out of you know that hive to, to stay in that. It's it's a fantastic yeah, product for us. For your throat or whatever, or with some lime juice, just five ten seconds maybe. If, if that yep. Happens, you don't want to kill what you're to do yep. And there are cases where um, heating up honey to to uh, to shut down those bacteria and the fungus and, and the yeasts that are in there are going to make sense. Um, if you're going to make mead, you want to have only a specific meast, uh, yeast, meast, yeast in the honey, then you're going to want to heat up that honey and you know make it not raw anymore so that you can control the flavor that you're going to get. Um, so there are times that you, you absolutely do want to cook your honey, but never boil it because it'll, it'll, if, you, if you get it too hot, it ruins the flavor. Which is why we don't do those stupid honey straws. Did you mention um, where you are uh, set up in terms of markets and different things? Yet? Not yet. Uh, that is Miss Audra, and she can uh, come up here and talk about what we're up to, where we're at it, and uh, where to learn more, how to find us. So we have uh, events every month. Um, if you go to pinesmoke.com, you can actually sign up for the newsletter. As of this moment, I'm only doing it once a month because that's all I have time and energy for. Uh, but we put out on that newsletter has all of the events that were booked for that month. So like this month, there's quite a lot going on. So first Friday, you'll always find us at the City of Eustis First Friday Street Party. So if that's something you haven't attended yet, it's a lot of fun. Uh, they uh, have for several years now. If if you're the sort to want to walk around with a beer, you sure can. They actually they have it for all adults. You can walk around peacefully, like with with whatever beverage you like, and you walk around and see a lot of different fun things. There's usually live music. Uh, so that's first Friday. We're going to be at the East Lake uh, Historical Society's Ninth Annual Heritage Festival on the eighth. Uh, there is going to be the third uh, Sunday. We'll be at Farron Park, so Whimsy Market. It will be their last fresh market at Farron Park for the summer because summer is just too hot to live. <laughs> so they do shut that down for the summertime. And then we will also be at the very, very end of the month, uh, the 28th and 29th, we'll be at Eustace Music Fest. Uh, so we'll be there. Those are both uh, evening events. So you've got uh, 6 to 9 on that Friday, the 28th, and then noon to 9. So that should be a great big thing. Free parking downtown, you know, so that's always nice. We love free parking. Uh, so those are, that's kind of everywhere we're going to be this month. Uh, we will, uh, coming up, ooh, come see. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we will also, you can always find us every weekend. Raise your hand if you've been out to the Donna Vista Market. Donna Vista Market, yay, okay. Cool spot. If you have not been to the Donna Vista Market, it's a smack between Eustace and Umatilla, uh, right by the Mason Jar Restaurant, if you're familiar with the Mason Jar Restaurant, right across the road from it. And it's a cooperative, basically, of local producers and makers and artisans. Uh, we, our honey there is there every single weekend. They're open every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, that is a great way to support us because 
I mean, they support us, but just by existing, uh, that, that gives us a place to be every weekend where we don't physically have to go and, and be, which is nice. So then we can take our efforts and kind of double up. So check out Donna Vista Market if you haven't. Uh, like I said, they are open every weekend. Uh, so you can find us there. Any other questions? You can find us on Facebook. Yep, yep. You can find us at pinesmoke.com. We've got um, everything that we have for sale out here um, on the tables and then some. So all of our beekeeping supplies are up on there. Uh, we do mentoring. Yep. Um, we, we will be having classes, class schedule released soon. Um, and we'll, as soon as we have our, our safety waiver legal form uh, signed uh, to absolve us of any anaphylactic shock that you experienced because you didn't know you were allergic to bees. You know, if, um, as soon as we have that form ready, then we'll be allowing people to come out to the bee yard and, uh, and check them out with us and get up close and personal. Beekeeper for a day. Yeah, uh, or an afternoon as it may be. Or an afternoon. <laughs> yeah, we got stuff to do. That's true. Uh, Brief. And I think that's it. So definitely connect with us on Facebook so we'll always continue to share where we're going to be. Thank you for that. Thanks guys. Let's find a queen.